All right, in this episode, we're going to carry on with our LilyGo board development, and we're going to write code to make this a functioning camera. So it'll be able to take pictures, we'll be able to save them to the SD card, and we'll be able to upload those pictures to our API endpoint. So here's our, our familiar webhook site that we've been using for development. I'm currently holding the TSIM cam camera, so it's pointing at this monitor. You can see every couple of seconds, about every 20 seconds or so, we're uploading a new photo. And if we open up that photo, you can see that this is a photo taken from the TSIM cam of this monitor. I've got the resolution currently set to HD. This camera actually can do much better, but then it takes longer to do the uploads. In addition, there's a bunch of settings for contrast, brightness, and other parameters that I do not have optimized. I just wanted to get this thing up and running and actually doing the uploads. And if we switch back, you can definitely see that it is doing those uploads now. So up next, we're going to take a look at the code changes to make this happen. All right, so the first change that we're going to take a look at is the camera class itself. This class abstracts away the hardware implementation of the camera itself. So you can't tell from the outside world you know, whether this is an ESP32 camera or if it's some other type of camera. The only interface you have is what you see in front of you. There's a couple of public methods here. There's a constructor that doesn't take any parameters at all. There's an initialized method on this class. There's a take photo method, and then there's a return buffer. And we'll talk about all of those in more detail as we see how they are used. Uh, some of the public properties that you see here is there's a Boolean indicating whether or not that the camera was successfully initialized. And the next two properties go together. One is the buffer and then the other is the buffer size. These two properties allow you to access the actual photo information. So the bits on the photo, and then you can do things with it. You can save them to the SD card or you can upload them to the API. And finally, the last property is if there is an error in this class, we're gonna populate what that error is here and make it accessible outside the class. And here you can see some board specific implementation. There is a camera frame buffer object that we want to get access to on the ESP32 board. And we're just storing a private variable so we can access that frame buffer. And then at the very top, you're going to see a pound if def for the TSIM cam board. Inside that, we're going to find pound defines specific for that board. And then we're also including the ESP underscore camera dot H file. This is a pre-built library that allows us to access many features of the camera and configure the sensor itself. So if we look at the implementation of this, at the very top is the constructor. Um, there's not much here. There's a pound if def that just allows us to initialize that frame buffer pointer to null. And we set the in is initialized flag to false. Here's the actual initialize function. You can see, again, you can see a pound if def if I hide if I hide all the TSIM cam, you can see this function is pretty simple. It's setting the is initialized to false and it's just returning that false. And so any board besides the TSIM cam, this is initialized Boolean will always return false. All right, now let's take a look at the TSIM cam specific initialization. Most of this initialization is configuring a structure here. And for this purpose, we're using a pound finds that we created earlier. You can also see where config the configuration is also board specific. And then finally, <clears throat> we use the ESP camera library to initialize the camera sensor itself. If the, if the initialization fails, we set the last error flag and then we return early. Otherwise, we carry on, we set the, the Boolean to true and we're doing an initial adjustment on the sensor settings. I haven't done much with these sensor settings. I did do a vertical flip on 93, and then I played around with the brightness and the saturation just for a little bit. But the image quality, I think, can still be much better. I did set the frame size to HD. You can see the different frame sizes here. HD is 1280 by 720. But using one of these enum values, you can set your frame size to what you want. And then finally, we return true. So the implementation for the Moduino board is pretty simple. It doesn't have a camera sensor. So when we take a photo, we return false and we set a no camera feature found error. And then for this return buffer function, there's nothing for us to do, so we just return. 
The T-SIM cam is a little more interesting because it has the onboard camera sensor. Take photo, again, we're gonna use the, the ESP32 library, that ESP camera library. And taking a photo is really just getting a pointer to the sensor's frame buffer. And once we have the pointer of the frame buffer, then we can get the photo that's currently in that frame buffer. But then we can set up the variables that we expose to the user in our class. And then we return true. And finally, the return buffer. This is an important call because what that's doing is that's returning that frame buffer pointer back to the sensor itself so it knows it can reuse it and kind of write over that. So it's important that when we're done with the data, so we, when we're done saving it to the SD card or we're done uploading it to our API, that we call this function to return that pointer to the sensor so that it can reuse it. And that's it for this new camera class. The next change that we're going to look at are the changes to our config files. The config file changes are pretty simple. We've introduced two new Booleans. The first one is a flag to indicate that should we save this photo to the SD card. And the second one is a flag to indicate whether or not we should upload this photo to the API. And if you look at the implementation of these, these are both right now set to true. With these two new flags, we're gonna be able to control the camera, whether or not it's taken a photo, and whether it's saving it to the SD or uploaded into the API. So now let's take a look at the changes to our main CPP class. And we're gonna take a top-down approach to these changes and we'll just talk about them as we go along. So in line 16, you can see that we're including now the camera class itself. So in line 37, you can see we introduced a file name for the photos. Uh, this implementation is pretty simple. Every time we take a photo, if we do save it to the SD card, we just write over whatever was there. You could have a little more complex implementation where maybe you rotate through some file names like photo one, photo two, photo three. Then you also have to make sure you're cleaning up those files. The next change is on line 42, we are injecting in a, an instance of the console to the HTTP class. So when I was making the changes to the HTTP class to allow the upload to the API for this file, I had some challenges. And so one of the first things I did was I injected in the console. That way I could print information to the console to help me out with the debugging. On line 46, you can see I'm instantiating the camera class itself. So I did remove a line that this was something that we weren't using and I removed it. So as we enter the setup, one of the first things I did was I did an update just to print these lines based upon the board itself. So if it's the Moduino board, I'm printing out the board information, the GitHub link and everything for the Moduino board. If it's the TSIM cam board, I'm doing the TSIM cam specific links. And then now towards the bottom of the setup, we'll actually see where we initialize the camera itself. So I made one small change here, just, just the GPS code. This is essentially turn off the GPS collection. And this just helps speed up the development for the camera class. So I don't have to wait on the GPS to lock in or, and collect a point. Um, so we're just bypassing all of this code until we get to the very bottom here. Um, we'll never get any points in the cache, so this code will never be implemented. And then at the very bottom, we actually see the new code for the camera. So on line 264 is where we really are detecting whether or not we have any feature for the camera turned on. So if there's no camera features turned on, we just skip all of this code. Otherwise, we enter this main if, and one of the first things we do is if the camera is initialized, we take a new photo. And remember that, ta that take photo method really has just given us access to the frame buffer for the camera sensor. And we'll see that being used down here below. If we are configured to save to the SD card, here's where the changes to the file helper, and we'll look at these changes here in a second, but this now, this code now writes the photo buffer to the SD card using our designated name. And we'll look at the changes to the file helper in just a little bit. If we are configured to do the upload to the API and we have a cellular connection, then here's the new bits of code to actually post that data based upon the frame buffer to the API endpoint. So the parameters for this new call are, it takes the API itself, and then it takes access to the photo buffer. And again, anytime we've collected a photo, we should return that frame buffer back to the sensor itself so it can be reused. 
And that's really the end of the new code that's in main CPP that supports the camera class. Now let's take a look at the change to the file helper class. You can see here in the header file, I've introduced an exists method that wasn't there before. The, the implementation is pretty easy. And then I've introduced a write method that takes a file name and a buffer along with the size of the buffer. This is the method that we're passing the frame buffer into. That way we can write that data to the SD card. Let's take a look at the implementations now. Implementation wise, we scroll down. Here's the implementation of exists. And again, that's pretty simple. Just using the SD card itself. Here is the, that new write method. And again, the file name, this is the frame buffer from the sensor. And all we're doing is we're opening the file and we're writing that buffer to the SD card. All right, now let's take a look at the change to the HTTP class. So there's really two changes here. The first is I'll first I inject the console in and I use that for troubleshooting purposes. And so you can see it in the constructor here. It's the second parameter. And then I just keep a copy of that down below for use. And then our new method is this one. So this post file buffer takes the URL, which is our API endpoint, and then it takes the frame buffer from our sensor. And so that way we can get access to the data and we can upload that to the API. So if we look at the implementation, again, you can see we inject in an instance of the console and we initialize our private member. And then down below, we'll see that new function. So the parameters again are the URL of the API endpoint. So the second parameter is a pointer to the data itself. And then the, and the third parameter is an indicator of how big that data buffer is. And again, depending on the photo quality, whether it's HD or some other resolution, you know, these numbers will change. In the next couple of lines, we're actually going to build the HTTP data that we're going to post to the API endpoint. And we're posting multi-part form data because that's the only way you can kind of include a file. And so most of this is making sure that we're following that standard that we have a boundary that we specified, and this can be an arbitrary boundary. I mean, I literally just picked boundary one, two, three, four, five as the boundary, but it has to be multi-part. You have to give the content disposition where it says form data, photo, and then I give it the photo.jpg name. And so when we send the data, what we're gonna see is we're gonna send this head string first. It has a boundary. It also has the content disposition and the content type. Then we're gonna send the actual data for the photo or the file. And then finally, we're gonna finish it off with a tail, which includes the boundary and this closing double dash. And the protocol is pretty finicky. If you're, if you're off by a dash or you don't have the right number of carriage return line feeds in here, then this protocol will not work. And so I did struggle with this. And that is the reason why I injected the console in here so I could print out my information. I've, since then, I've removed all my console prints. And so I've cleaned it up a little bit, but you still have access to that if you need to. So the AT command set that we're sending is pretty close to the same thing as we had before. So these set of lines, if you scroll up and you compare them to the, you know this set of lines that's up here, they're pretty much the same thing. So one of the first things is there's only one of these commands. I did struggle with this also. I thought maybe I would send this multiple times, um, but this is the way that you have to do that in order to get all of the data as one packet. And so you send one of these commands, you send the total size of everything. And the total size here is actually the size of that header, the size of the actual data itself, the photo itself, and the size of that tail that we're gonna stick on the end of there. Once that's sent, then we send over the actual head bits, which is the boundary layer. Then this code in the middle chunks up our photo and sends the chunks over. And so you can see the chunk size I chose was uh, 4,096 bytes, so four, four kilobytes. And I have a buffer here for it. So I keep looping over all the bytes until I've sent them all. Um, but you can see there's an outer while loop here. And then on the inside of that while loop, I keep filling up the chunk buffer. 
and here's where I'm actually sending the chunk itself. So I write the chunk buffer with the chunk size to the API endpoint. And then once I've sent all the, the chunks of the actual photo itself, and then I close by sending that tail, which is what you need for the multi-part data set. And then finally, I close out the AT command set, very similar to what I did before. All right, let's finish up by getting a clean build of everything again. I'm in the TSIM cam environment right now. I clean the build and let's build everything and everything's green. Let's switch over to the Moduino. And again, most of the camera code is just essentially commented out for this because the Moduino board does not have a, a built-in camera. But if we build this, there are some yellow here. If I take a look at this, I think this is just, um, I was even saying it's un unused variable. So if we go look at this, I had some variable that I was using for debug purposes. I was printing this out and comparing it to what we sent. Um, and again, this variable isn't used, so we're just getting a warning. Not a big deal for that, but everything is green. And so because everything's green, let's go ahead and check this code into our environment. And while we're here, we'll go ahead and tag this too. That way we can always get back to this if we ever need to get back to this. And by the way, this code is it's up on GitHub. This is the GitHub repo. And I'll, I'll leave a link to this in the video description. But you can now see this last spike that I just pushed up. And then if you want, you can get to the tags through here. And here's the TSIM camera tag that I just pushed. That's it for this video. We did manage to get the camera sensor working. Um, next time I wanna look at the microphone sensor and see what we can do with that. And then at some point I wanna revisit the power because we haven't really done a good analysis of how energy efficient this is. I did talk previously in the last video about the power analysis that I had previously done and how it was a little bit flawed. And I wanna revisit that. So if you like content like this, press the like button and subscribe below.